Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. It's already April. I was going to review this yesterday, but unfortunately, the room got hot out. But I did keep it cool, turn on the air conditioner, but I did use a filter, so I'm hoping that nothing goes wrong, nothing spreads, because that's what I'm worried about these days. I'm not sick, so I'm alright. But I figured, you know, I wanted to take a break for a while. But, uh, the movie I was going to review as a celebration to that day was April Fool's Day. The 1986 original, which is a mystery uh, slasher film about college students spending their spring break uh, with their best friend on a New England island mansion. We're just pulling out some practical jokes, you know, just having fun until something mysterious happens. Yeah. This just recently got a new Blu ray from Screen Factory um, for the first time ever because it's been long on DVD since 2002 from Paramount. Now that the Screen Factory got the deal with Paramount, you know, just like they've been getting deals with other studios like Universal, 20th Century Fox, MGM, even Sony, and of course Warner Brothers, so they're getting there. Um, but I heard that their special features were solely lacking, which makes it a disappointing release, but otherwise, you know, it's better than nothing. Um, there's no 4K remaster transfer, a 2K um, transfer that they got, which apparently was based on the HD master uh, a couple years ago. So it's the best they could do. I mean, it, they could have had an alternate ending. They could have had more of the cast, you know, joining them together, maybe do some commentary, but. What can we do? <laughs> um, anyway, during the spring of 1986, um, there were two films coming out. I know there was another one also, but there were, yeah, which was Slaughter High, but I believe that came out in 87. But there were two films, uh, this movie and Killer Party, which originally was going to be titled April Fool. That was released by MGM. Both of them were from Canada, filmed over there, even though they did use some American actors here and there. But Killer Party did not get a release until May 9th, because they're trying to avoid the competition with this film, hoping that this will lead to this particular special day. <laughs> because the film was released on March 27th of 1986. Um, it was sort of um, a modest hit, but it only made $13 million out of its $5 million budget, so consider it a, a bit of a box office disappointment. So it could have done so well. Got mixed reviews from critics, mostly negative, which doesn't deserve, um, mostly because they were, they were sort of fooled into this movie. Yeah because of the plot twist and turns and they thought maybe the violence wasn't exactly as gratuitous as they were hoping they would be. They felt like they were cheated. They, like they didn't think this was going to be the the actual slasher film that they were hoping for, but that was the case. Sorry about that. It's, this is why critics are always giving films like this a hard time. They did the same thing with all these other slasher films too. I mean, yes, there are worse ones out there, but the ones that we had at least had smart writing and clever, a lot of cleverness, too. Plus, you got a likable cast, all which were fantastic. I mean, this is something that we've been expecting upon its release, because this was produced by Frank Bacuso Jr., the producer of all the Friday the 13th films, yeah, under his production company, Hometown Films. 
And we got Fred Rolton, the director of When the Stranger Calls, the original with uh, Carol Kane. Excellent movie. So, they took time and effort to actually come up with a film that would be good enough for this particular holiday that not many people celebrate. But, but hey, it's a holiday for practical jokes. Just throwing some laughs. A lot of gags. But of course, there will be screams, too. <laughs> As victims fall one by one. And yes, this movie does have a remake that came out simply straight to video in 2008. Don't bother with that version. That one's a joke. It, it's a total insult to this particular film alone. Let's get to this review. Stars Deborah Foreman from Valley Girl. She was also later in a comedy called My Chauffeur, not a good one. She was also in the movie Waxworth, too. She's a great actress. Um, another Deborah here, <laughs> Deborah Goodrich, who I believe she was from Remote Control and Just One of the Guys. Yep. Great movie. Finally going to get a Blu-ray, by the way, from Sony. Yeah, Jay Baker. Uh, Ken Alant. Griffin O'Neill, who happens to be um, the son of um, Ryan O'Neill. Lee Poussant. Clayton Rodner from I, Madman, along with The Relic, uh, Murder One. Um, Good vs. Evil, uh, among others. Also, in the, he was also in just one of the guys too. <laughs> yes. Amy Steele, yes, from Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. A very underrated actress, but she's also uh, sweet. Very talented. Thomas Elf Wilson, yes, Biff Tannen himself. On the Back to the Future films. Well, at least he plays a likable character this time. <laughs> Not a bully. Uh, Tom Heaton, Michael Nomad, Lord Bevy, and Pat Barlow. It's written by Daniel Bach and it's directed by Fred Walton. The movie began set on spring break, which led to April 1st, which happens to be the holiday of all these practical jokes that they had to pull, April Fool's Day. <laughs> set somewhere in New England, we meet a group of college friends, Harvey, Nikki, Rob, Skip, Nan, Chaz, Kit, and Arch, all played by an excellent cast here. They're about to spend their weekend on an island mansion that's run by Skip's cousin, who's a student at Bazaar College, Muffy St. John, who's played by Deborah Foreman. She prepares around several details of the house that she was trying to bring in some inheritance here and there. She went down to the basement and found an old jack-in-the-box that she actually received for her birthday uh, back when she was a little girl. You know, they were like celebrating her birthday party, which then she just opens up the jack-in-the-box, you know, ringing around, and suddenly it pops out, turns out to be somewhat of a creature inside. So it leads to like a practical joke right there. Her friends, however, are joking around on the pier. They're riding on the ferry, which that's where they led to this antics, such as uh, when Arch was actually uh, threw in a knife at Skip. It went straight into his stomach, and then he fell off the ferry. And they jumped off and picked him up, only to realize that this was a prank. But that's what led to a biggest um, Botesria's uh, nightmare when Buck was seriously injured in a gruesome accident. 
which then that's where his face has already been crushed and you can see his eye coming right out of out of his uh, socket Ugh, nasty yeah so apparently he was going to be taken directly to the hospital as soon as possible so once they were on the island it turns out Muffy had a set up a variety of pranks throughout the entire mansion and ranging from simple gags such as a whoopee cushion dribble glasses exploring cigars even some uh, newspaper clippings uh, <laughs> uh, the the lamp gag you know in the bedroom where they had to turn off the light and then suddenly another lamp comes on and then they turn off that light and then another lamp on the roof comes on until they they find a way to take off the light bulb and then then all the lights turn off and of course the <laughs> um, the rolling chair where Arch actually fell off <laughs> um, yeah then you hear like a baby crying that might have came directly from someone's room it came from like a, a recording and even heroin that's spread around even some of those S&M um, gags that they had in the guest wardrobe uh, so on and so forth <laughs> so despite of that the entire group was set to relax but then when they woke up they found out that Skip went missing that he might have been attacked um, that's when um, you know they, they spend all morning you know just going around playing games like playing soccer out and then they're just going around swimming or so but then um, the kid suddenly catches a glimpse of what looked to be his dead body of uh, Skip and they were pretty shocked and then soon um, Arch and Nan had also went missing yeah Arch somehow got caught by a trap and then the snake was about to attack him even both Nikki and Nan had just went to uh, the wells so they can get some water on the discover that yes there have been dead bodies lying around even ones that got their heads cut off yeah, and, I, and I know the latter was starting to break off too worse yet the group had soon begun to find out that all the phone lines are dead you know they're trying to call them out to see if they can come over and try to find where all the missing the members are but they haven't shown up and that was the case also this is what led to another uh, story here because Muffy actually has a twin sister named Buffy and unlike um, Muffy Buffy is basically shy she just goes around you know talking pretty uh, soft and suspicious here like there's something underneath her that it couldn't be trusted but we're also trying to find out what happened to Muffy too well as it goes around yes uh, all the members have been banished or even get killed before their bodies have been found it led to several clues around all the way um, of course they even show in the dowels it looked like one of those Barbie and Ken dowels which is the, the entire friends that, that Muffy had created pretty clever and then it also led to red herrings of what's going to happen you know like you know, one by one are they going to survive for this or not or if this is going to be basically another prank well that's what led to the story of this movie um i don't want to give away too much though however um, i can understand that for those who've seen this movie especially in theaters yes i mean 
often or not, you could definitely get fooled by all the surprise twists that you'd be able to see about what's going to happen to them. Like if, like if this whole thing may be imagination or so, or whatever it takes, or who is going to survive. Um, but that's how you have to find out for yourself. And yeah, I have to admit, I was fooled when I saw the surprise twist. But you know what? They did it in a very clever way. Because after all, this is the movie. So that means if this was going to be part of that idea, then then why not? I mean, you have to figure out for yourself. I guess in a way, this movie is more like an Africa Christie uh, type of story. I guess you could say it's almost like Clue. Or the, the the comedy, murder by death. But they're going for a slasher vibe to it. And as for the the slashing in the movie, yes, um, it is um, at times a little gory. Um, not too, I mean, not too gory. But they sometimes they actually did it uh, as sort of a prank. Or in some cases, you're not so sure if this is actually real or not. But they did it um, with practical effects. Um, but for the cast itself, I mean, they were totally excellent. Uh, they really nailed their performances. I mean, Deborah Foreman, on the other hand, is the strongest of them all. I mean, she really uh, totally nailed everything. I mean, the fact that she plays a different character, one of... of the twin sister because we begin to know how suspicious she really is and I thought that was really cool because um, she's a very um, she's a very great actress um, as for the rest of the cast I mean Amy Steele um, definitely uh, plays a great job as um, did a great job as Kit Graham uh, she's very beautiful too uh, so was Deborah Goodwitch as Nikki Brashares. I mean, she basically goes around studying, you know, because you know she likes all these plays, or she's always into like amazing stories here and there. Um, of course, uh, Thomas L. Wilson as Arch Cummings. I mean, he's just just hilarious, you know. You know, he he always likes to be the jokester here. <laughs> Joins in with his friends Chaz and, and Skip, both played by uh, Clayton Rodner and Griffin O'Neill. Uh, I, I love the moments when he actually says, Lifestyles of the Witch and Undeserving or whatever. I mean, I love how they're always joking around and everything, too, throwing all these crazy pranks and stuff. Especially where Skip always brings in the knife. Um, Chaz always films everything. So is the rest of the cast. They were excellent too. I mean, there's that's another great thing about this movie was that they're all likable. There's not a single stupid character around that's acting like a dick. But if they have to act like that, then they're basically jocks. That's how they act. And I know they talk about sex and drugs and stuff. You know, and I mean, they really talk about that stuff. Um, I mean, consider it's our rating because it makes sense. It's not just the violence; it's also the language. And there's, and there's like a little, maybe a tiny bit of brief nudity. Um, mostly from, you know, Nikki, where she woken up. I mean, basically topless. You can see her panties. But not all the way, just just underneath her shirt or any other. But the idea of this is that um, no matter how they do it, I mean, you had to solve every single clue in order to figure it out who did all this. You know, like who who did all the killings. You know, why have everyone's been disappearing? You know, why why are they doing this? I mean, why did they plan all that? That's plain and simple.
So I, I think they really did an excellent job uh, with the direction, the writing, the score. That was actually done by Charles Bernstein, um, who has done several scores from other films. Uh, Charles Minsky uh, did some beautiful cinematography, uh, especially at the opening where you saw the Paramount Pictures logo from 1975. Which, I, at first you thought that, yes, the film was going to be the pan and scan, but they actually uh, cropped it from the left to right because they were just using it as a, a baryant for the uh, video footage before suddenly the aspect ratio changes once we get to the opening of the um, the basement where they show a a mannequin that's being dragged out. I thought that was really cool. And I know they, they even throw in some other jokes too. Just going around, you know, pulling their own April Fool's jokes. So. Um, but yeah, I've been fooled, but you know what? I'm glad that I was fooled because I had fun. I really did. Um, I think it's definitely an underrated gem. You know, it deserves a lot of credit that they go for. And it's actually one of the better April Fool's movies we've ever seen. I mean, certainly better than all the other films that followed after that, like, for example, Killer Party, which I didn't care for, but that was certainly the case. And um, I think Slaughter High is okay, but I wasn't exactly particularly a fan of it. Um, I would avoid the remake, definitely. I believe there was also another film under the, the name April Fool's, that came out in 2007, but yeah, I, I had a feeling that one might be bad too. Um, but all in all, it's good fun. Didn't deserve the hate it's gotten from critics, but what, what can you do? And I, I love the soundtrack that they got, which I know you may have heard on the trailer. Mama Told Me Not To Come by Free Dog Knight. You know that song. Mama told me not to come. Mama told me not to come. She says, that ain't the way I have fun, son, that ain't the way I have fun. Nope. Yeah, that classic song, which I know you often hear in some movies too, like even TV spots of other films. E even though this is an 80s film, it does feel like it could have been dated back at the time when that song came out. <laughs> but perfect timing. But it's fun. Um, definitely pick this up on Blu-ray if you get a chance. Uh, maybe someday I might take my chances if if that if all goes well. Because I know we're already into this virus situation here. It's not going to be easy to go out. We have to wear a mask and and gloves to protect ourselves. Um, unless we could just order it online to pick it up. Um, there is a DVD release, of course, but I think this is just plain fun. So anyway, that's April Fool's Day, and I give the movie five stars because I really enjoy it. Not a single bad scene ever. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.